be live. There, it is now officially live. All right. So hi, everyone. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your virtual star party for August 4th, 2013. And we have got a big crew today, and maybe more. So lots of telescopes, uh, good weather across the, uh, the, I guess, the both countries, Canada and the U.S., so it's going to be a, a great night. So I'm going to introduce uh, everybody who we've got for telescopes first and then talk about some of the special guests that we've got tonight. So first, telescopes. We've got Chris Elliott, who is still setting up. So I don't know if, Chris, you can hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay, well, you, you let us know when you got a view, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll show. But I have to mute you because we are definitely getting an echo from you. Okay. All right. And we lost Daryl, which Ooh. I'm sure he'll be back. But, but Bill's now, here. Now, now Bill's taking his place. <laughs> Daryl will be back. Daryl will be back. So this is great, though. So so Daryl uh, is in is in the East Coast, which is great. Yeah. East Coast of Canada, or East, he's in Ontario. Ontario. And he's going to be providing us with some wide field stuff. So he's actually set up his, his camera, and he's doing great wide field astronomy, so he's going to be uploading images. We're going to try and get a meteor. This has been on my to-do list of, of things that I want to see, and so hopefully we're going to get a meteor. And we've also heard rumors that there's some auroral activity happening in uh, in Canada, so he might accidentally get that. But Daryl has just has dropped off the face of the uh, hangout, so hopefully we'll get him back. This is what happens in Ontario, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Internet. It's, it's very sketchy. Uh, we've got Bill McLaughlin from Oregon. Hey, Bill. Hi there. It was it was sort of hard to get you in at the last minute, but are you uh, are you going to be able? To, you've got clear skies. Uh, yeah, I got clear skies. It's uh, not entirely dark yet, but I think we might get something. Okay, great. Uh, we got Gary Ganella from Los Angeles area. Hey, Gary, and your skies Hi, are clear. Yep, looking good. No horrible fires. Nothing burning. All right. Nope. Great. We got uh, Michael Phillips. Hey, and his cocoon nebula. How are you guys doing? Good, good. The human cocoon nebula. All right. <laughs> we got uh, we got Roy Salisbury, the human ring nebula. Hello. <laughs> um, okay, great. Our astronomers yeah. don't have faces anymore. No, they they faces. become the ethereal yeah, yeah, exactly. objects in the sky. Uh, we got Stuart Foreman, who is still just setting up. So there's. All right. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> great. And then of course my, we've got my uh, my co-host Scott Lewis. How's it going, everyone? And so we've got a very... Did I miss anybody? But Daryl is, is returned. Just a black box right now, but Daryl will, at, at some point, I'm sure show us, either introduce himself or show us a... Uh, there he is. Oh, he's in the dark. He's there in the he dark. Is. Outside. Hey, Daryl. All right, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so get us a Navis a Perseid tonight. That'll be great. Uh, great. And so then as a special guest, we have invited Kevin Nelson from Quantum Scientific Imaging. And as you've probably, if you've been watching the, uh, the Virtual Star Party from week to week, uh, we talk a lot about the different cameras that we use. And the sort of about half or a third of the Star Party crew use QSI cameras and love them to pieces. And so we thought it would be great to actually get someone from QSI to join us. Uh, to both talk about the cameras and also just talk about astrophotography and talk about the uh, and and then join us as we appreciate the images that we're taking. So uh, hey, Kevin, how's it going? Going great. Thanks for having me. So can you give us a bit of a, a just a quick background on on what QSI is and and what you make and everything? Sure. Um, so QSI manufactures uh, cool CCD cameras. Um, typically used for astrophotography and life science imaging. Um, also some industrial and uh, research, material science type of imaging as well. Uh, we launched the company in 2005 and first introduced the first products in 2006. And uh, we've been you know, steadily growing in, uh, in the astronomy world and also in the, in the life science and research worlds. Right, so your cameras are good for both, or you have versions for both telescopes and also for like microscopes. Correct. Yeah, same basic camera works. I mean, our, our cameras typically go on telescopes and microscopes. Um, there are a lot of different optics you can, of course, put on put on a camera like this. But um, say telescopes and microscopes are uh, are the dominant ways of uh, of getting photons onto the sensor. Go for and, photons. And I know Gary. Which which camera do you have, Gary? It's a QSI six eighty three. Do you have one of I those behind you? I originally had the five eighty three, and then I upgraded not too long ago. And I, and I have exactly the same one. 
You're welcome, Kevin. <laughs> yeah, <you're welcome. laughs> <Very much. laughs> yeah, yeah, and Lou's got one too, so we've definitely got a, a bunch of them going on here. I've got a 683 WS-8 sitting here behind me. I have it hooked up with a, with a Nikon lens. I was doing just some test images uh, yesterday, so I have this rig set up where I was shooting stuff inside, so I thought I'd go ahead and leave it set up. Yeah, you can actually you can join us and, and show us the inside of your uh, of your office there, can't you? I can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great, uh, cool. Okay, so well, let's uh, let's move on to some to some images first, and then we'll we'll kind of catch up a bit. So uh, I'm going to start with Daryl's view because this is awesome. Yes. So, so Daryl, can you set this up for us? What are you What are we seeing here? Oh, he's muted. You're you're muted, Daryl. You muted, Daryl. So this is his pointer. Is his point, is his and tail. he's using Windows OS, and we're looking <laughs> at the Andromeda Galaxy. <laughs> no, you got to unmute yourself, Daryl. There we go. There, there we go. go. I'm just—it's a little laggy um, on a uh, a laptop that's pretty slow. So, um, yeah, it's the Andromeda Galaxy. Um, I've actually—I have my uh, DSLR set up on a uh, an equatorial mount right now. Um, and this particular image of uh, the Andromeda Galaxy is uh, 105 um, focal length, is, is 105. So I'm looking at pretty wide field. I'm doing some 18 uh, millimeter shots tonight, hoping to, uh, to catch a few meteors. So, But this one here is, uh, I believe it's two minutes in duration for the exposure. That's that's great. So I, I'm trying to think. So like a 105, that's like if you get one of those zoom lenses, the 105 is sort of the the zoomier part of that of that lens. Yeah, it's actually the, uh, that's exactly what I'm using is one of those zoom lenses, um, and it's the uh, it's the extreme. I have an 18 to 105. So and then I, it's on a, a 1.5 crop sensor, so you're looking at approximately 160 millimeters of total focal. But it, I mean, it's terrific. You can see the whole galaxy. You can see that little satellite galaxy. That's amazing. And that's like I said, that that's two minutes. That's unstacked. That's nothing. That's great. So. No, I, I, this is this is. I can't wait. Definitely move to the wide field. Like I can't wait to see some of these images. That'll be great. That looks to be about fifteen degrees across. Could very well be. You you got me on that one. So. <laughs> well, I'm judging by. I take a, a degree and a half. So I'm judging by my Andromeda and then looking at yours and multiplying it. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm gonna move to I'm gonna move to Gary's view and uh, and I. This looks like the Eagle Nebula to me. Yeah, you got to know that one. Yeah, of course. Uh, it's really, it's really crisp and clear tonight. Taken, yeah, this is taken with no binning. This is a two-minute exposure. So here's the famous pillars of creation. And uh, so we've got a question from Will Kalman for Kevin, actually. So is it worth it going from a full-spectrum modified DSLR to a cooled one-shot color CCD? What are the advantages in addition to less noise? Um, um. The, 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 there are a couple different different ways of looking at it. The, the first thing is just having the cooled camera will reduce the thermal current dramatically. So that gives you much more of the dynamic range of the sensor available to record light. And along with having just the reduced thermal current, you also have the stability of the temperature. So you can always get matching darks to go with your uh, with your light frames. Um, beyond that, there you know the, the read noise is dramatically lower compared to a DSLR. So you're you are going to get uh, significant improvement in uh, signal to noise ratio with a cooled one-shot color camera versus the DSLR. Yeah, Stuart and I both just made a switch, I think, and, and yeah. I'm definitely noticing a huge improvement, leaps and bounds. Yeah, I um, I didn't go to a one-shot color, though. I went to a, um, I, I went straight to a, a mono. Yeah, me too. A mono CCD. You know, a lot of people, um, DSLR, DSLR imagers, have a preconception that it's easier to work with the one-shot color. And what we found over the years is that most people who make, who make the shift, there's certainly a learning curve as you go to, you know, capturing the data through different filters and then, uh, you know, learning a couple new processing steps. But once you've made that leap, the increased flexibility of doing monofiltered imaging is pretty dramatic. Yeah, I mean, of course, the uh, all the people in the VSP know that for me, for the for exactly for the virtual star party, it, it 
if we like color. I like color. Maybe I'm messed up, but thought yeah, you're uh, kind of are. You're, you're a little picky like that. <laughs> a little too. picky like that, yeah. So, but I mean, definitely. I mean, if you've got time and you're not trying to broadcast your view of the night sky in real time, then then there's real value to having uh, a a black and white. So you can do those one filter and then change your change your filter, take another image, change your filter, and then produce a really nice composite image. Well, and one thing to think about on the uh, single shot is if you've got an 8 megapixel chip, you're capturing 4 megapixels in green, 2 megapixels in red, and 2 megapixels in blue. Whereas if you do it with a monochrome with the three filters, you're capturing 8 megapixels on each color. Well, that's been my experience, too. I mean, I, I started out years ago with, you know, uh, I use mostly SPIG, but uh, started out years ago with monochrome cameras and color filters, and you know, recently tried DSLR mainly just because I had one, and and tried uh, also for a short period of time a, a one-shot color camera. And after using the dedicated filtered cameras, and then trying to use a one-shot color camera, you, you're just not going to be happy with the one-shot color cameras once you've used the filtered ones. The the results are just not as good. Sure, there's more work to do it with the with the filtered images, but but uh, you know, you get what you pay for both in time and money. I think. Oh, is anyone else find it a little surreal that the duck cluster is talking to the Eagle Nebula? <laughs> <laughs> quack, quack. <laughs> quack. Okay, so, so, so uh, Bill, uh, I think this is a color image, right? Yeah, it is. This happens to be a, a, a DSLR just because, you know, for a cluster and for a two-minute image for a star party, that's, you know, DSLRs are actually great for that. Uh, but if you want a real long exposure image, not so hot. Uh so that's great. So that's the uh, oh, okay, great. I'm gonna move to uh, we're getting to a Roy's lot of, view. We're getting a lot of great comments. Uh, apparently, you have a lot of fans of QSI, Kevin. So that's always good. <laughs> oh, yeah. Always like to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Steve Perry asks, can any of your panel, uh, maybe Gary, uh, suggest a good location in Southern California to do some night photography of the Perseids? I'm guessing Joshua Tree. Joshua Tree. That's where I would go. Or the San Diego dark sky. If you're in southern, like in, in Orange yeah, County, Yeah, depends right? on how south you are. I mean, yeah. if you're down by San Diego, definitely go out to Tierra del Sol, down by San Diego. But if you're over in the L.A. area like us, I go up to Joshua Tree. That, seem, that seems to be the best place that I would go. Joshua yeah. Tree is good. Out by the Salton Sea, there's several good locations, too. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I've moved to the Ring Nebula. Uh, this is Roy's view, because I... I there's too many images. You're getting all ooh shiny. I know, I know. Uh, okay, so uh, right, so the Ring Nebula M57, located in the constellation of Lyra, it is the uh, is the view of what our sun is going to look like uh, a few billion years from now when it expands out to a red dwarf, uh, sloughs off its outer layers, and dwarf, then yeah. uh, collapses down. That's into a good a show, but it's going to be a red giant first. Red giant. Yeah, uh, yeah but. Uh, the and and the misnomer is that star in the middle there actually isn't the white dwarf star. So nope. it looks like it could be, but it's just the angles, like MySpace pictures. It's all about the angles. <laughs> it's a duck face. <laughs> uh, um, Michael Cook says QSI rocks. I've been using the QSI five one six for three years for pro am science imaging using BVRI filters. Uh, did that make any sense to you, Kevin? Because it didn't to me. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. The, um... The 516 uses a, a Kodak TrueSense KEF1603 sensor. It's a 1.6 megapixel sensor with a 9 micron uh, pixel. And it's particularly good for uh, photometry and other types of scientific imaging because it's a non anti blooming sensor. So it is uh, provides completely linear response right from bias all the way to saturation. So it allows you to very precisely uh, determine relative levels of light for the objects that you're looking at. Uh, Stuart Foreman, you're live. Okay, this is the Epsilon Lyra. This is the my very first image taken with my QSI camera um, for a virtual star party. Nice. And um, this is... <clears throat> excuse me, it's uh, one of the... It's a double... It's called the double-double... Uh, uh, um, just called the double double, what we call it, the double double, and uh, I just like it because you see two double stars, like right next to each other. Daryl, back me up here. That means something completely different in Canada. <laughs> I know what that is too. 
Yeah. That means you're having a really sweet coffee. It's really sweet, very <laughs> creamy coffee, yeah. yeah. If you go to Tim Hortons, you order a double-double. Yeah. You get a double-double with some Timbits, and you're having a good morning. Awful, yeah, it's an awful thing. <laughs> in, Southern, in Southern California, it's a burger. Oh, is it? Yeah. Yep. yep. In and out burger. Out. Yep. Um, so Michael A. Zapata asks, uh, someone help me select my first DSLR camera, please. And I think we'll um, need a little more information to know what yes. you use it for. If you're doing astrophotography, you know. Or just uh, regular photography. Right. Um, for, for astrophotography, generally, Canon is um, kind of the preferred, although I know people who do Nikons just because more people... You know, are there, there's more people who use astrophotography with Canon cameras, and that's what I have, and that's what um, uh, Corey has, and I think what Bill probably has too. Yeah, Corey just got his hands on a Mark II, on a 5D Mark II. Nice. Well, mine's a, I, I've got a, both a Mark 5D Mark III, which I use for more for regular photography, and then I've got a, a 60DA that I'll occasionally use for astro. I think the biggest reason, frankly, aside from the fact that Canon has astro DSLRs, uh, biggest reason is everybody I've talked to that's used both Canon and Nikon feels that if you're going to use the camera lenses with it for astrophotography, that the Canon lenses, uh, especially some of the primes, are better for astrophotography because they're flatter out to the corners. Nikon yeah, guys don't, chi- don't like to hear that, of course. But <laughs> <laughs> I can chime in on this too. I, I actually do shoot Nikon. Um, I use a D7000. But the biggest, the biggest issue, or the biggest thing, because um, I did a lot of research when I when I picked up mine. Um, the the biggest thing is uh, back prior to the newer Nikon cameras, they had an issue called the uh, Star Reader. Um, it, generally, what happened was the the image processor, even with the raw image, made stars disappear. So Canon was the big one, and because Canon was so much superior to Nikon in the early days, um, as far as um, programs that you use for astrophotography, uh, processing, everything like that, there's so much more support out there for Canon than there is for Nikon. Well, there is that, and uh, the other thing I have noticed, though, and this is um, not camera-specific, it's really lens-specific, where I've put uh, the Canon and I've also tried Nikon lenses on my SPEG cameras, uh, I've found that the flatness out to the corners in that case where you remove the camera from the formula and they're processing uh, from the formula completely and you're just looking at the glass, I've found that the Canon glass is better uh, in the corners, especially in terms of chromatic aberration. I'm going to move to Michael's view. Cocoon Nebula. Yeah, I'm just kind of playing around here, zooming in on this one while I try my hand at the North America Nebula next. Enhance and magnify. Yes, I know you love that, right? In Biggin. In Biggin. So, in yeah. big in. so I, I, I turned my hand at the Sequence Generator Pro for my new camera here, and it's got a lot of nice functions where you can kind of zoom in and you can play with the, uh, you know, the, the live stretching and you can kind of zoom in. To like that part there. It looked so. really good for a second there. Yeah, I can. So you can stretch the image just yeah. by moving the mouse wheel up and down there. So Go back. Yeah. That's the program I'm using too, but I don't know how to use it as well as you. Know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm still on eval mode here. I don't know if you, uh, my title bar is hidden, but I got 14 days left on it, and I'm definitely going to buy it. This is a very cool program. So okay, I'm moving yeah. to Lloyd's view because it's gorgeous. Are you shooting through any clouds? Any high clouds? Who? Michael. Uh, yeah, I am, a little bit. Yeah, I was just wondering the graininess of it. I was getting the exact same thing. Yeah. I'm shooting through some really high clouds. Yeah, and I'm, uh, I'm on the North American Nebula I know, here, too. I have completely lost control of today's star party. Um, <laughs> you know, you know, I never had control. control. You had control? Yeah. Well, you know, I can still control the camera, so I've moved it to Roy's view of this beautiful uh, N51. Yes. And the and slewing you. is away. <laughs> you muted Stuart's sl- slewing. Yeah, that so... Two-minute luminance image. Oh, wow. And what camera are you using, Roy? I am using an SBIG STT8300. So just to give people a sense of price, you know, if you're going to buy like a T2i, you're going to buy, you can get a pretty inexpensive Canon DSLR. You're looking at about 300 bucks or so, just straight up body. When, uh, if you want to get like a T5, T1i, yeah, when okay. I bought my T1i which was the, like, three years ago, it, the kit 
including the 55 millimeter zoom lens or whatever that came with it, it's like 800 bucks. Prices have come down. Yeah. Yeah. For, to buy yeah. one, you know, used yeah. or, you know, and if you want to get like the, the newest one, like the T5i, you're looking at about about 600 bucks for the body. So what would what would your camera run, Roy? Multiply that by 10. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So are, this one, are you the, looking at adopting middle-aged men? <laughs> <laughs> this, just, one has, this one is the, the fully decked out as far as you can go with the eight-position filter wheel, the all of the all of the filters, the off-axis guider, everything. Uh, and so for the for the QSI, what's the equivalent uh, QSI that that uh, you know would be a good starting one for people? Definitely in astrophotography, the uh, the eighty three hundred sensor is is dominant because it's uh, it's actually a very simple formula. It's more pixels for less money. So the um, R six eighty three model uses that same sensor and fully set up um, like that camera with the eight position filter wheel, uh, integral off axis guider, the filters, everything is around four thousand dollars. There you go. But you you have an entry level one that's that's. More yeah, start around that. twenty around twenty seven ninety five for a uh, camera with a five position filter wheel that you can put on a, put on the back of your telescope. Yeah, I'll take eight, please. Just yeah, <laughs> mail, mail you need more filters. Yeah. yeah. Now your filters on on the QSI on that camera are they the um, inch and a quarter? Our filter wheel uses either inch and a quarter inch threaded filters or thirty one millimeter unmounted, and okay. because the Filter wheel on our cameras is so close to the focal plane because it's, it's it's inside the camera. We're able to get unveneated images with one and a quarter inch filters to about f5, and using the larger uh, clear aperture of the 31 millimeter unmounted filters, uh, all the way to about f3. That's one of the things yeah, I'm shooting really like. Yeah, I'm just, shooting just f1.9. Just to warn people tonight, I am not even going to bother trying to translate. This is going to be a full-on geek fest. So, yeah. <laughs> so if you want to just like turn off the audio and just look at the pretty pictures, yeah. you can do that. We'll, we'll close caption it later on me. Jargon, jargon, jargon. Jargon, but, jargon, but, but if you jargon. want to steep yourself in this sort of full-on tech talk, then uh, yeah. then we can provide that for you as well. Or if, if our great guests would like to help... Um, Make this a little bit better for our laypersons watching as well. That would be great. Well, I, I was going to turn the tables on you because I came from the planetary side of the house and I started with a color, you know, webcam like everybody else did, and realized that monochrome was the way to go. So I bought a nice filter wheel. Now I am actually using that filter wheel for deep sky now, whereas I had purchased it and used it for many years with planetary in mind. And so I take the planetary camera off now, and I can put the, the color filter wheel in place with the new CCD camera for deep sky stuff, and I'm ready to go. Of course, I don't have enough positions now for all the uh, narrowband stuff. but <laughs> So, you, I mean, there's a lot of flexibility in, in what you can do with monochrome in general, right? And it's just kind of the, the use of the camera in how you, how you treat it with your filter wheel, I guess. Uh, Chris and uh, Daryl, just to let you know, we've got black screens for both of you guys, so I don't know if you're trying to stream something, but... Oh, by the way, I'm looking at the North American Nebula here, at least a yeah. little portion of it, so something different. The North American Nebula, this is an emission nebula in Sagittarius? Uh, no, I think it's up, yeah, it's up in Cygnus, Cygnus? which is yeah. nearly overhead for me, so... It's yeah. so about all I can get is a little little dome of, of glimpses between the clouds here and again. These are real clouds up up in up in space, not not <laughs> not serious clouds floating by. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna move to Stuart's view next. Oh, you know I haven't done Gary's view. Let's do Gary's view here. Uh, well, something that I normally don't do. That's a globular cluster, M13. Nice. And a galaxy, I think. About a galaxy. Up in the top little, right. No, no. There, there there is one in yeah. that view. Yeah. Okay, it's, it's around 2:30. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a, I, I, I got it um, last last week. I think it's like a tenth magnitude uh, NGC object. I forget the name of it. Sixty two hundred something. I think. Yeah, they're um. all the same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> seen so, one NGC. You seen them all. <laughs> so so sorry. That was the that's M thirteen. Yeah. Yeah, M thirteen. Just thought it'd be a good one to throw up there. Yeah, so M M13. So tell me about this great the, globular cluster in the Hercules. Great, the great globular cluster <laughs> in Hercules, uh, which is great. You can even see it with the uh, needed eye if you've got really nice dark skies. And 
it's it's a wonderful object. And it's from 300,000 stars just in that little fleck ring, which I think is awesome. Just thinking about numbers that big in a tiny little dot. And that. it's as old as the galaxy. Yeah. Boy, talk about a traffic jam getting around. Right? <sighs> yeah. Well, apparently, like in the 1970s, they aimed a, um, a radio pulse yes. at, at it. Yes, yeah, from the Arecibo. The Arecibo yeah. telescope, you know, and I, I guess they want to think because nobody could live in it. You know, because the stars are so old. And there's well, nothing maybe there. it's the pangalactic intelligence that doesn't yeah. need corporeal <laughs> bodies anymore. And Perfect they're just made place. out of hydrogen and helium. And it's good. Uh, so, Stephen Ron says on uh, Google+, Plus, the combination of Magic Lantern and Backyard EOS make Canon a very strong choice for astrophotography. And I will, I will second that, which is that the... Uh, Magic Lantern, if you've got a, a Canon, a T3, T4, T5, and even the 60D, you want to find your way to installing Magic Lantern on it because it is a terrific piece of software. It essentially gives you a ton of additional functionality in the camera. And we, we use it for automatic white balance and doing uh, time lapses. Like You don't need a, a separate intervalometer to do any time lapses, so it's just terrific. So I, I consider backer, sorry, um, uh, Magic Lantern to be... Absolutely necessary. And Helen Reed actually made a great point: is that this is the beginning of Geek Week. Oh yeah! So, happy Geek Week, everyone! So we can totally nerd out. About yeah, totally nerd out. I think we've started out pretty, 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 pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> we are doing our part for Geek Week. <laughs> this is for you, YouTube. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> it's always for YouTube. It's Look always at their for comments. YouTube. It's all about them. Yeah. So Stuart, uh, what are we looking at? This is the Dumbbell Nebula, and um, I, I sort of missed the color in it. This is a, a monochrome of it. It's actually a very pretty uh, nebula with red and on the outside and blue on the inside, but you know, I'm just shooting luminance uh, right now. But <laughs> excuse me, this is a planetary a nebula, which is uh, the remnants of a nova that of a star, not a supernova, but a nova of a star that went kablooey. And there's a little white dwarf in the middle of it. I don't know if that little star is the white dwarf, but there is one. I think it and, is in this case. Yeah. 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 So um, it's obviously called the dumbbell because of what it looks like. Uh, so we've got another question here for Kevin. Uh, Jim Cox asks, and I think this is a terrific question, is it possible to use multiple monochrome cameras with different filters at the same time? Absolutely. Sort of like an interferometer. Oh, inter oh, interferometer. Well, uh, not exactly an interferometer, but essentially use three cameras observing, you know, the three different wave, three different filters at the same time, and then same object at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, that's basically. I'm kind of, sort of doing that right now. Um, I've got three you different scopes build. on the mount and uh, <laughs> three different me. cameras. Although one of them is a is a, uh, a DSLR, but I've got two STT 8300s on two of my scopes. Different image scale, but you know you can do it. Well, you know what might be the, fun. The biggest problem there is differential flexure. The, the the thing that might be fun is if somebody and I can't get it, it, it point it point your scope at, at M20 because it has a, a red nebula and a blue nebula right in the same field of view, and then just change filters between a red and a blue or even a green, and and you can kind of compare and contrast between them, right? So you'll see the red nebula is very bright in the red filter, and the and then the blue nebula is very bright in the blue, and vice versa, right? So that's kind of fun, if anybody can point it at that, just to um, illustrate what what Jim was getting at. Sterling says uh, he's snoring and says, "Less camera talk, please." And uh, like I said, <laughs> sorry, I Sterling, man. Sorry. <laughs> I apologize in advance. This is going to be the uh, the nerdiest camera fest uh, you've yep. ever experienced. So. And Helen so gave us an excuse yeah. now. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and he gives an excuse that we are doing our part for Geek Week. So, so, but Bill, what is this? Uh, I see a satellite. It's actually it's a satellite, but uh, it, the the kind of the fuzzy misshapen. This is up by the North American Nebula, but it's not in the North. North American Nebula. It's uh, NGC 5068. Uh, it's a red uh, nebula that was taken with a uh, with a red filter um, and uh, with a TOA 130. So it's a relatively you know medium small field, view, thousand millimeter focal length. We've got a lot of black and white tonight, so if you want to show us those color images, that would be super. I'm working on one razor right now. Doesn't yeah. love those anyway. <laughs> it's totally not for I'm him. just I'm just thinking about the viewers and they're yes. you know. 
for when you watch it later on, like, come yeah. on, please, this would be great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, BTL 743 asks, how long till we see Orion? When do we get Orion back? It's like, December, like you go to Stellarium, you can see it right now. Yeah, um, or get up at f- yeah. 4 in the morning. Right. Oh, Gary, that's amazing. What's this? That's a swan. M, um, M17. That's the one that we also call the lobster. The lobster. And I've decided it's the... I'm seeing like a cobra. Like a dun, dun, rearing dun, back dun, dun, cobra. Dun, dun. Oh, I see it. Yeah, it's like its face Ooh. up there, and then it's sort of hoods out on the side. No, I can see the lobster. You see, yeah. you see the lobster? It's also known as the checkmark nebula, the omega nebula, the horseshoe nebula, NGC 6618 for all you number files out there. Um, yeah, it's... It's got a lot of names. Yeah, but look, uh, look at all those, like the just the dust lanes and the, yeah. the those structures in it. So this is another star forming nebula, like the Orion Nebula, and the one that right. that our own sun formed in billions of years ago. And it so that bright region the, in the very the middle way, there, there's yeah. yeah, and there's bright, hot young stars in there, obscured from view in some cases, and heating up all that gas there. And it's, it's actually pretty close to us. It's only around five to 6,000 light years away from us. So when we're thinking about the, the deep sky objects we look at all the time, this is actually really relatively close to us. Uh, I think Chris has got a view now. Ooh, nice. Can you zoom in on that middle part, Chris? Yeah. There we go. So this is the difference, and I think this is great. And, and so this is exactly perfect. So this is the Ring Nebula, and this is what it looks like in color. You can see just these different colors, that red on the outside and then that, that green in the middle. And the, the red is what corresponds to hydrogen, and the green is oxygen, I think. So, but you can see there's also a lot more noise. Um, you know, the original view that we had from, uh, I think it was from Roy. Yeah. Was 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 a lot crisper, and so that's just what you get. So with the color CCD that uh, that Chris is using, you get those colors, but you don't get necessarily that same level of of detail that you do with something like Roy's view. But that's great, Chris. Nice, yeah, nice I work. Like Very Thank good job. You. I'm gonna move to Roy's view, and Roy also has the dumbbell. Yes. And that's the and there you can really see that white dwarf in the middle of it. Right. Yeah. I can zoom in on that a bit and get you uh, a little bit more. Although I think I, I liked its other name, the Apple Core Nebula. I could totally see an Apple Core there. Yeah, when you look at it in color, it looks like an Apple Core. Yeah. yeah. But this is another planetary nebula. So this is another example of what our sun may or may not look like in the in the far future. But but each one of these planetary nebulae is, is completely different because of the the different star that came before, the way that they puffed out their outer layers, and the the various magnetic fields that sort of surround the rotating white star, white dwarf star. So each right. one is completely different. Well, here's that color image too. That might give a little bit of context to the. Yeah. The apple core. See that? And so to produce an image like this, uh, the color one that, that Scott just shared... You need to work for ESO. And you'll yeah, be- what you need to do is have the largest telescope in the world and uh, start from there. Yeah. And then, and then, But then take three images in three different wavelengths. And then, or use three different filters, right? Right. They probably did three different wavelengths for that one. Actually, for that image, I'm not seeing where ESO did get their... But I, I'm sure it's something insane. Yeah, in many yeah. cases, those kinds of images, they just take three different wavelengths, like they oh, might do, say, field. oxygen, or they might do, like, uh, three different wavelengths of, of infrared and then turn that into a, a, a three-color image. Yeah, the, the three different wavelengths they use were from 429 nanometers, 501, which is 03, and then H alpha at 65, 656 nanometers, and uh, using the, the very large telescope. Right. Which I, I love the that names. Name. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the overwhelmingly large telescope. Yeah. <laughs> the irresponsibly <laughs> gigantic telescope. I um, think we're going to need a bigger boat telescope to just, you know, yeah, let's just make it a little bit larger. Stuart, I've moved to your view. Oh, what have you done, Stuart? 
He's broken the cardinal rules. What he's done. He can't. He's muted. He yeah, doesn't he, realize. He's muted. He didn't take a picture of a cardinal. Yeah. Sorry about that. No, this I just wanted to show the color. This is we're talking about the color. This is the same. I just I took this. This is the first image I took with uh, the QSI camera that I bought from Kevin, and it was just sort of a test image of of, of focus and framing, and you can kind of see the 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 green and the red uh, around it. Um, but I'll I'll go back to the live image of what I just did. Um. Which is this guy, and um, this is M101 with a satellite going through it. Wow, that's a, that satellite's really far out there. Yeah, <laughs> going right yeah, through isn't it? it. Yeah. So uh, this is a face-on uh, spiral galaxy. Uh, this was a two-minute image, bin two by two, um, and uh, uh, slight noise reduction. Uh, filter on it, but that's about it. Uh, yeah, so this is the pinwheel, also known as the pinwheel galaxy. Right. Correct. M101, it's about uh, 21 million light years away, and they find as there was, that's right, there was a supernova in M101 just pretty recently, last year, or two years ago. Two years ago. Right. Yeah. Which is great. It's actually it's, one of my favorites. I, I don't know, I, especially when you're able to get really long exposures on it, you're able to pull out a lot of detail because it is so face on. You're able yeah. to get a lot, you know, just a lot of detail out of there with the different filters you're able to place on. Oh, Daryl's got a view. I'm going to go back to Daryl's view for a second here. This is so cool. So, Daryl, you've switched to the wide field view now. Yeah, I'm uh, 18 millimeters right now. Um, just kind of waiting for a streak of light. I haven't seen one yet, so I just figured I'd put something up different uh, to, uh, you know, keep keep things uh, moving along. But, but is that the Milky Way going through the middle of it there? Yeah, you can see the the, the northern northern portion, or I guess it's in the northeast right now, um, of the Milky Way in there. Be a double cluster and uh, Cassiopeia, also up near the uh, upper left hand. Corner. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. So if, if anyone knows their night sky, if you go, if you look at Cassiopeia, just below it is Perseus. Kind of looks like a, I always imagine it like a spike that's coming up towards Cassiopeia, and in between the two of them is the double cluster, and uh, and that's terrific. You can totally see it in your in your photograph. Yeah, I've changed the ISO. It's a little uh, the light pollution. Uh, that city actually just to 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 give people an idea of of light pollution. I'm in a pretty dark area. I can actually visually see the Milky Way where I am. This image here is uh, uh, 120 seconds at ISO 800 and it's still oh, wow. too much light pollution. Yeah. And that, that city that it's showing up the uh, light pollution from is probably about uh, 20 miles away. Wow. Oh, wow. You need more of that corn nebula in there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the occultation of the, the niblets. It's definitely <laughs> dark <laughs> nebula. So. <laughs> All right, I'm going to have so many choices here. Okay, I'm going to move to Chris first. Chris, what do we got? We got the Lagoon Nebula. Nice. And you can really see, again, in color. Chris is running colors. You can see the uh, the red in this in this image. It's just great. Uh, and then Gary. And I'm using a Canon. Oh, sorry, what was that? I heard he's using a cannon. But he's using a cannon. <laughs> okay, he's using a cannon. Okay. Well, I'm gonna move Man. to move to Gary's view. Gary, your view is That's is upside the same down. One, the lagoon. Oh, nice. Yep. It's three I. And then. Uh, Gary, can you can you flip your image so we can see the Borg Homer? Yeah. Oh uh, yes, I can. Let's see. And I will pretend to be Lacutus. There we go. There it is. <laughs> now, I know we've talked about it a lot, but just so everybody knows, I'm shooting in a very, very narrow bandwidth given off by just excited hydrogen Wee. called hydrogen alpha. So there's a lot of excited hydrogen in the universe, but light given off by everything else, uh, I don't see in my pictures. And the reason is I live in a very light polluted area, and without the narrow band filters, I can't get anything that I would write home about. 
So you know what's unfair? Gary's got like con- consistent clear skies all the time, yeah, but but yeah. nobody cares yeah. in Los Angeles. They're all you know doing their own thing with their lights and screwing it all up. See? Yeah. What fair. can you say? <laughs> yeah. This is this is the Borg Borg Homer. That's what we said. Yeah. Here's the yeah. Borg eye transplant and the nose and Homer's mouth and the little wisps of hair. <laughs> the ear. <laughs> the ear. And the neck. It's crazy. Yeah. That's Homer. Okay. Um, so Wayne W is asking, are you guys using any filters such as sky glow filters in line with the camera? And I think Gary, you have the best example of somebody who is fighting light pollution. So can you explain what you what your setup is? Um, I've got when I do shooting that isn't for the star party, I shoot the light of hydrogen alpha, sulfur two, and oxygen three. Uh, very very narrow bands. I'm shooting I think right now at um, 12 nanometers. So the entire light spectrum is about 300, boy, I can't remember the numbers, about 300 nanometers across, and I'm shooting 12 nanometers of that. So I'm taking a very, very narrow slice of light that this hydrogen is giving off, and I'm shooting that color. Um, When I try to shoot, we talked earlier about the one-shot colors, I've got a Canon 20DA, and when I try to shoot here, I can get a 15, 20, 30-second exposure, and there's not much there. The lights, the sky is just too lit up in all the regular wavelengths. But this one, uh, this one's kind of neat to zoom in on yeah. with all the little dark gnarls and the wave fronts and yeah, whole bunch of neat stuff going on in this nebula. And so a large, a lot of those eye. those dark knots that we're seeing, there's there's stars inside of that. Mm-hmm. But Gary, right yours, you may be shooting shooting this narrow narrow band, but you're also shooting at a very fast focal. Ratio. Yes, yes. I'm I'm shooting at f 1.9 and it's a 14 inch scope, so it's about 700 millimeters. Uh, I'm moving to Bill's view here. Oh, this is great. I don't know what this is, Bill. What is it? That's Cocoon Nebula. Oh, it's, it's the same thing that Michael had. And I'll have a monochrome image in just about a don't, second. Don't here. worry about it. Don't worry about it. Actually, the monochrome color. image is a little bit better. I'll switch to it real quick here. Is it is it also in color? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not that he's biased no. towards color <laughs> images. <laughs> right. ones. I'm just uh, putting that out there. Yeah. I'm just saying. That's pretty good because I've ta- I've taken the cocoon before in my digital SLR, and it, it's it's a tough one to pull out. But it's but clearly to, to be in fair, like though, the it's in the the Milky Way, isn't it? Because I mean, look at the stars around it. Well, yeah, and it's interesting. You, you can see now. that path that kind of goes up to it, which is is actually, if you if you look at a long exposure image, it's kind of a, you can. It's very obvious that it, there's a lot of dust there, and of course you don't see the stars there because of the dust. Um, so that has like a bullseye pattern around it, right? Where you have the the red nebula in the center, and then there's a dark area around it, and then the stars start. Uh, there's a there's a <laughs> monochrome image uh, uh, with a longer focal length that I just took. And that's it taken with a red filter, so you can see the red part of the nebula. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fraser's biased. <laughs> I am totally God, biased. I am like, I'm just, oh, I'm, oh. You know what? I'm thinking of the viewers. I know the viewers are like, I love those color images. Well, so. And again, you know, we're now in HD, so these colors I know. come out that much, you know, that much better. So. Yeah. Uh, so Michael Phillips, that's yeah. awesome. I had I had the bubble nebula here, and the clouds killed my guide star. And yeah, so it looks like it might was be going to warp it. or something. Yeah, <laughs> engage. It looked, but you can it see it has it has like a little ring shape to it here. I don't know if it's a bubble like it had pushed out uh, from. Are the you w- running Windows ninety five? Is that your screensaver? Yeah, it's it's zooming and looping around. Right? <laughs> I think that's the Death Star, just as it's firing. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, somebody on Google+, Plus, I don't remember who, I have to go find, they did a really neat trick with a zoom lens. They were focused in on um, uh, just a bunch of stars, and then in the middle of the exposure, it was like a 25-second exposure, they, they twisted the zoom so that it gave that Star Trek effect, you know, where, oh, the, nice. where everything kind of goes into one point. It was a pretty neat-looking photo, actually. Much better than mine. Uh, Wayne W notes. Uh, he said, oh, "Okay, unfortunately, all my cameras are CCD color with a sky glow filter. I'm in the market for new monochrome due to everything now 64 bit. Any recommendations below two thousand dollars? So monochrome camera below two thousand dollars. Get another thousand dollars. Right. <laughs> <laughs> not, that, not that I want to uh, say anything. QH or uh, 
QSI might have one, but QHY has some monochrome cameras that uh, the QHY nine you could probably get for under two thousand, and it's an eighty three hundred chip as well. Uh, yeah, I, I, I ended up, I ended up giving coupons for <laughs> giving out coupons today. Yeah. Um, I'm no. moving to no. Roy's view. Oh, nice. That is M5. M5, so another globular cluster. Um, just in terms of the QHY, I, I looked at that, um, but I ended up deciding to go with uh, the QSI, basically, mostly because it's manufactured and support here in the United States. QHY, I think, is a British company? Um, Ooh, or Chinese. European, or is it Chinese? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's the thing. It's like, you know, in... Um, when I when I called uh, to ask questions, you know, Kevin answered the phone, was talking to me, and you know, was help, helping me go through my angst of trying to decide what to buy. Yeah, well, that's I interesting. I, I, I've always been an S big fan, and I when I bought their color STF, uh, which I didn't keep, which is not related to the camera, it's related to some extender issues it didn't work very well with. But uh, I noticed that they've taken a page from Apple because I believe it said built in Singapore, designed in California by SBIG. <laughs> it's like very Apple-esque. <laughs> uh, well, that, that's a terrific M M5, Roy. That's great. That, that's so crisp and clear, and that and that is that's that camera, isn't it? That's why we keep you that's around, the, Roy. That's the dark skies. That's the dark skies. Yeah. So if people don't know, dark uh, Roy has built a secret facility in uh, in the desert <laughs> on the moon. He, on the moon that he <laughs> that he operates remotely. So uh, okay, I'm moving to Stuart's view. Oh, Stuart, that's terrific. Yeah. This is um, this took my last view of the night because I just clouded up. But this is part of the Veil Nebula, the Eastern Veil. And I am pleased as punch with this image, um, and it just shows the low noise of the, you know, of the monochrome camera. Um, this was a three-minute bin two by two uh, image of um, of the veil, and you can really see just some of the wispiness of it. And this was a remnant of a supernova explosion that happened, yeah. um, you know, I don't know how many gazillion years ago, but um, uh, this is one part of a huge ring, basically. It's the Eastern Veil and the Western Veil. It's a whole complex, and this is just a, a tiny part of it. Yeah, it's located 1,470 light years away, and it detonated about 5,000 to 8,000 years ago. That's great. Yeah, but this is, um, I'm, I'm like jumping for joy. Here. Yeah, no, this, this is, is, this is, this yeah, is, this is, this is terrific. We'll let you, we'll yeah. let you come back, Stuart. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to move to Daryl's view and get another shot of that nice uh, wide field. Wow, that's gorgeous. Wow. No, this I've is live. Be, this is an older shot. This is oh, not live. Okay, all right. Okay, I just, I'm still waiting for that streak of lights, so I figured I'd put up... Well, uh, keep putting uh, up images. Keep putting up images <laughs> this while, is a, while this we is, wait. This is actually yeah. about uh, 45 minutes stacked at 18 millimeters. Oh wow. oh wow! So in here you've got you've got the North American Nebula, you've got the Veil Nebula. Um, there's it's quite all... a few uh, deep sky objects in this this image here. That's great. Terrific image. Okay, and Chris has got a new view too. What do you got, Chris? Any guesses? I'm waiting for it to load. I just see his icon right yeah. now. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, I got the. Oh, we'll, nope. you cut out. Andromeda Galaxy. Oh, this is Andromeda. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Uh, moving to. Oh, so many choices. Okay, I'm going to go to Gary's view. Okay, this is uh, the Trifid. Nice. And the interesting thing to illustrate the uh, shooting hydrogen alpha, if you do this in true color, there is a whole piece of this that I'm missing right here that's blue. Uh, gorgeous thing is when you look at this in uh, true color light, this is all red, and then there's another blue part. It's just gorgeous, but since I'm filtering all of that out, I don't see it. 
and we can zoom in and again and see the, the dark areas, you know, in all these little knots and nodules, there are solar systems and stars being born. Fantastic. That's great. I mean, I've got the, the color image up there, so you are able to see the blues in there, but the, the detail you're able to get with those knots and those, those dust lands are looking fantastic. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with what I get. I sure couldn't do it uh, any other way from here. Oh, that's terrific. Okay. Uh, we've got another image from Roy. I don't that, know what this is. That is M17. That's the Swan. Um, Swan Nebula. Yeah. Omega. Omega, right. Lobster. lobster. Check mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is uh, the Bob Nebula. Uh, that's great, but you definitely did a much quicker exposure than Gary's, I think, because you're not getting that that central <clears throat> star region getting totally blown out. Um, this was a two-minute image. Oh, Ooh. really? Okay, all right. Yeah. Huh. That was a two-minute luminance image. Been uh, well, you're fired, two. right? Sorry. <laughs> we we want to see it get completely ruined in the uh, in the middle. <laughs> this terrible star formation. Well, there's I, Gary and I keep missing each other. That. Uh, that I when I do my images and I show them, I do a log stretch on them, so that I don't blow out a bunch of uh, areas. So yeah, I'm oh, trying to our okay. audience the, the log, your log stretch. What are you meaning by that? It it takes the image and, and it will take uh, the high points of the image and and make it where it doesn't totally overgrown, and it'll take the low parts of the image. And boost them up a little bit. I I don't know mathematically how it's done, but it's a normal screen stretch is just going to move the the white and black pointers to say you know chop off this much of the white and chop off the other end of the black. Right. But the log stretch will will balance it out across it. Excuse me, Kevin. What image did you just have up that you just took down? It was some amazing narrow band image. Yeah, I had, you were talking about the veil, so I put up um, an image that one of our customers... Oh, let's see again. Took. I'll, I'll put it up here for you. Oh, wow. Yeah. This, so, this, is, this is a narrowband, right? Yeah, this is a narrowband image. So this, you know, um, Stuart was talking about um, taking the hydrogen alpha image. In this image, the green is the hydrogen. The blue is oxygen. As you go into the yellow and golds, um, it's sulfur. And this is part of that, that huge uh, veil nebula complex. It's a supernova remnant. And this is uh, taken by a, a Canadian photographer. He's from Quebec. And this is about uh, 20 hours of exposure wow. in the three, uh, using the three narrowband filters. That is just off the hook. Your move, yeah. Gary. Your move. <laughs> in your really light polluted is. Los Angeles gear, your move. Yeah, yeah, hey, yeah. You, you know, talk about about um, about being able to do things in Los Angeles, though. Let me put up one more for you. Um, All right. Uh, I think Ronald, Gary is a great example of what can be done in light polluted skies. Uh, Ronald Minch asks, uh, with today's equipment, can a live video be obtained for the meteor shower? So, actually, that's what Daryl is here for, is he's capturing 30-second uh, wide-field images of Ontario and attempting to, to capture a meteor. And so, if things work out, we'll be able to show a meteor, and, and if not, then we won't, which we probably won't. But Because we want it. <laughs> yeah, because it's important to us, so it won't happen. So, so that was the plan. We've never been able to capture Meteor live, so we're Daryl is on board to help us try and fulfill that childhood dream. Uh, so, so what object is this, Kevin? Uh, this is called the Heart Nebula, and this also is uh, this is about 24 hours of exposure through a four-inch telescope. This is a four-inch refractor um, called a Takahashi FSQ 106. And the remarkable thing about this image is it was captured from the middle of urban Los Angeles. So that's one of the magic things you can do with these narrowband filters is they look at such a tiny spectrum of light that it, it, you can shoot right in the most light-polluted areas in the world and produce phenomenal images. 
Gary. Talk about a gauntlet thrown to Gary. My <laughs> God. You <laughs> could live, Gary, in the most light-polluted places yeah, Gary's going to race quit. <laughs> No, we've seen some of Gary's images in the oh, most yeah. light-polluted area of the world, and they're terrific. So he can, yeah. he's got this under control. I'm sorry, Gary has left the building. <laughs> <laughs> and it's hey. only a four-inch telescope, Gary. Yours is so much... No, you, it's a refractor versus... A, it's a, it's a Takahashi. I know, that's a, I know that's a, a, Do you need a hug? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's a, that's a sick telescope. A four-inch Takahashi is a pretty fancy telescope. Definitely. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, I'm going to move to Bill's view. And we're actually running out of time. We're, yeah. we've, we've reached an hour. So uh, I know we're, the images are coming fast and furious here, but we should start to wrap things up. So, Bill, what have you got? Six, which is a galaxy, spiral galaxy. And then up to the left of it is a cluster uh, 6939. And then there's, like, another cluster down on the bottom right. Or are just looking stars? at it upside down? Oh, the are just stars. Yeah, okay. As opposed to the thing in the upper left, which is stars. And I'm going to, real quick, like, switch to... The monochrome version. A monochrome version. Yeah, that was taken would. with a, That was taken with an FSQ, actually. Even still, the, the detail you're Evolution getting... Is, of yeah, no, this is, is great image. to show the comparison. This is terrific. And this one was taken at 530 millimeters with a STT8300, whereas the color one um, was taken with uh, a Stellar View Raptor, which is 735 millimeters with a Canon 60DA. Can we get a view of your overloaded mount at some point? Of the, of the mount itself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So people can see how you're able to produce all these images at the same time. Let me pull that you up. Have... I'll just have to turn the light on up at the observatory, which I can do here real quick. Sure. See, his, his mount is actually Optimus Prime. And... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, Gary, it's Gary's time to shine. Check this out. Gary, put it back. I'm putting it. What, I'm putting it. I saw what you had there. Where'd I go? Hang on. I, I see your face. Hang it on. is pretty. I'm, uh, I pressed the wrong thing and messed things up. There we go. Oh, I'm moving away. Okay, there, we there we go. There we go. Oh, there it is. Look at that. Now, that's shot from the light pollution. Now, an interesting thing. This is uh, where I mapped, just as um, Kevin said, green is the hydrogen, blue is the oxygen, and there's not much sulfur in this picture. When you take the really long exposures, you can get that out. But this picture is the same picture mapped at different colors. Right. So now here I've got the um, sulfur, er, the, excuse me, the hydrogen is mapped as the red. And then the sulfur and oxygen are mapped at the uh, oxygen's blue and the sulfur would be the green. And I kind of like the way the colors on this one came out. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that great. That's great. I think I like the other one better. I think I like the other colors better, personally. You like the green? Yeah, but this is good. Except for when it's the sun. If the sun is green, Fraser freaks out. Run! Yeah, the sun <laughs> ought not to be. Or Saturn. I need Saturn to yeah. be yellow. I just have... Okay, so, ch this so is check about out Bill's... Oh. About an hour and a half at each color. So you just need to do another, say, 20 hours at each color, and then you'll be caught up. Mm -hmm. yes. Challenge accepted. <clears throat> it is on. Um, all right, Bill. So check, so check this out. This is Bill's mount. This, I love this setup. A poor fact, mount. I'm, I'm moving it now. There you go. Oh, look at that. <laughs> that is so great. Yeah, when I move my mount, you mute me. I know you yeah, <laughs> Because you're right it. in front of your telescope. I know. <laughs> if you set up a secret facility in the desert, then we wouldn't have to. Or, uh, you know, if you had a separate observatory built in... I've seen your property. you got room. <laughs> oh, it'd be sweet, wouldn't it? So yeah, so that's a TOA-130 uh, 1,000mm Takahashi in the middle. The one on the top is the FSQ-106, and the one on the bottom is a Stellar View Raptor, uh, which is a 735mm uh, carbon fiber made in California. And, your uh, and on top of that one is diamonds. a little tiny guide scope made by SBIG, and I use that because that's a DSLR scope that I'm using, so I need something to guide it. And is that a paramount? Yeah, it's Paramount. The oh. the, the regular regular ME, mm -hmm. and then you know it's rated at 150 pounds. This has got about 140 on it, I think. <laughs> but it works quite well. It guides it guides well. I'm yeah. not having any issues with it. 
and you can take those those you can show us those color and monochrome. You you've beat me at my own game here. I gotta say, you want monochrome? Show you monochrome. You want color? I can show you color. <laughs> That's awesome. Good. Okay. Well, I think we're gonna wrap this up. So so if we can have some humans again, that would be fantastic. Uh, and then I will start to say goodbye to people. So first. I'm going to actually say thank you very much to Kevin for joining us yeah, for, thank for you, this. Kevin. Did a great job. We had a bunch of questions, uh, and it was great to have some one of the actual manufacturers. You're the first person who makes the stuff that we use, which was which was great to be able to talk to you and and share our enthusiasm in the in the cameras that you supply. So my pleasure. It's really fun to see the images live. It's not a way that um, that we typically get to see things, so it's great. Yeah, I know, no, I know. I mean, for a lot of people, they, it makes them feel bad because they. They expect these 24-hour images that they right. do. Well, well, I won't let them go past about 120 seconds. So, you slave driver. I'm a total slave driver. Yeah. So, <laughs> so thanks. So thanks for joining us. You're welcome anytime. Anytime. Yeah, my got, pleasure. You know, anytime much. you got some new gear, some new techniques you want to show people, it'd be great to have you back, and we will geek out again if if YouTube will uh, will permit that. So so thanks a lot. My uh, Stuart, thanks for joining us. Sorry you got clouded out there. That was great. No Congratulations for your on your first light with your new setup. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. All right, Roy Salisbury. Oh, there's your mount. That was great. So you can see here the. How do you spell that? How do you pronounce that? Halapai Valley Observatory. That's a hint to where it's Roy's secret Wall facility is. Wall that cave. Wall which, cave. which planet is which that? Which planet on? is this yeah. secret facility in? Um. Michael Phillips, aka yes. the Bubble Nebula. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm happy to be hanging with you, uh, deep sky mono imagers now. Yeah, this is all new to me, and I think Welcome everybody's jumping cloud. in the same boat. Yeah. Well, it's you heard fun. we had Pluto and uh, and Neptune last week, right? Yeah, you got showed up. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Who yeah, brought that? Did Chris bring that? No, Lou brought it. It was pretty. It was pretty amazing, actually. Nice. It's like, oh, v Neptune's up. Let's just go grab that. Oh, and there's <laughs> Pluto. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, that was great. Uh, was Gary Ganella. Everybody? Challenge accepted. We look forward to your 24-hour view of the Veil Nebula. And I'm going to have, since everybody's sharing their scope, I will do mine right now. Yes, you've got a great scope. Love this it. is uh, this is live. Can you make a dance for us? <laughs> make a dance? Yes. <laughs> dance, telescope, dance. <laughs> okay. Um, there's a bit of a dance. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's a two-step. <laughs> That's great. Uh, I want Harlem Shake or nothing. That's it. <laughs> uh, Daryl. Yeah. We we didn't get a meteor this week. Yeah, unfortunately not. I'll uh, I'm gonna keep shooting. If I happen to get one, I'll uh, I'll throw it up on Google well, Plus. Anyone who wants. So so in this event, you can all put in images of things into the event itself. So if you any photographs that people took tonight, by all means, if you're an astrophotographer and you're watching this, or you're watching this after the fact, go ahead and put your images into the into the uh, into the event, and then they'll all be there as a big collection, and we can all remember fondly the beautiful pictures that we saw tonight. So so welcome aboard, Joe. It was great to have you join us this this week. Yeah, it was uh, nice to finally be able to. Yeah, and we look forward to more holidays on Mondays, so you can come hang out with us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Chris, uh, you're just a black image right now, but uh, thanks for joining us, man. Thank you. All right. And uh, Bill, thanks for bringing us the color and the black and white. Both no at the same time. problem at all. I like doing it. All right. I, did I miss anyone? Scott. Here I am. All right. Thank and you, so, everyone. And so, Scott, do you want to just quickly... Uh, do a quick log roll here. You are taking over, helping out on the Deep Astronomy 